So today we'll be chatting about uh, listening to customers, so how to have impactful conversations, get good information that will be useful to your marketing efforts. Obviously, when you are in a business, you have a sense of what your customers need, but it's a thousand percent more valuable to hear it from their voices. We, we can guess to the end of time, but to hear it straight from them, hear what their pain points are, hear not just what they want from your business, but what is making up their entire ecosystem and how you can make sure that the, the points that you're making in your marketing efforts are actually going to resonate with what matters to them. Someone as a, you know, who we might be talking to, there's no guarantee that they know their customers that well. They try to, and, and sometimes they do, but other times they don't. And so when we, when we do these exercises, these customer interviews, it's obviously enlightening to us and it helps us a lot, but we've also seen this help our clients a great deal. Understanding, understanding their buyers in a way that either is deeper than what they had before or that they just didn't know. The risk of not doing customer interviews and relying on secondhand knowledge is, I think worst case scenario, you, you put out a, a piece of content, whether that's an email to prospects or a piece of content that is supposed to be speaking to their pain points and you completely miss the mark, you portray a scenario you think that is relevant to them and actually it, it totally misses the mark. So not only are you not resonating with them, you're hurting the potential authority of your brand, you're hurting the um, thought leadership that you're trying to create and instead are coming across as perhaps not as knowledgeable as you'd like to come across. So that's um, kind of a worst case scenario and a big risk there. And the long-term impact of that, it is so easy to destroy your reputation or totally eliminate the authority that you might have had with an audience. And when you, you know, lining up customers to speak with them is a challenge. That's hard work. and we rely on those customers being willing to take time out of their day to do that. So understand that, but if it's an easy thing to try to do to get it right. So I think that's why it's important to try to do it as often as you can, because if you don't do it and you, the things that Mary said, if those happen, it's very easy to alienate an audience that you worked so hard to get. When I interview customers, I or I would recommend someone to, I say start in their world. What does that mean? It's not helpful to dive right into, okay, we're trying to market this thing and these are the five, six, seven points we're trying to sell on. Does that resonate with you? You're speaking your language. You need to be speaking their language. So I like to start with very simple questions, but confirming their, their title, their role, what the responsibilities are, getting that high level stuff, asking, all right, what, are, what initiatives are you working on right now? Um, when you get off this call today, what will you be knocking out today? What, a, what is something that is a challenge for you right now? That helps to, one, just get them more comfortable with the conversation, and that, that will, in my experience, allows them to open up a little bit more as you're talking to them, asking them questions about what their challenges are. So I would recommend just starting with questions that are about them and their world and their immediate concerns. If you can get some background intel on these folks too, and we try to do that to understand, you know, ahead of time, who you are, who do you talk to, what do you do if you hang out online, stuff like that. To get into their world, sometimes we there's no other thing to do than to actually get into it, and so we rely on, in some cases, pre calls or just some light information gathering from our team to figure out like, who are you try to get to know them a little bit before we ever talk to them. In the beginning of the conversation, as I'm asking about their role, what they're working on, as they describe things like, say, they're working on managing some supply chain issues, they're having issues with their own supplies and their customers are too, that's something that is inherently stressful for a business owner, for an engineering manager. So something as simple as, that sounds like a lot to manage or that sounds like a big challenge. Something as simple as a, a statement confirming or that that sounds like this, would you agree with that? Makes them feel seen, feel heard, and then they tend to open up more. Yes, that is very stressful. I am really challenged with trying to get things out the door and I need XYZ to help me do that. Then you got that nugget of I need XYZ, that's what you're looking for, but you did it in a way that felt more natural and was more of a conversation-based uh, approach. 
be like giving them a chance to complain about a problem. Um, I, it, who doesn't like complaining, right? <laughs> Let's be honest. I love moaning about my problems to whoever's going to listen. And if, uh, if we give these customers a chance to do that, you can get a lot of really great information, like contextual information about their world that, you know, even the best prepared interview question list might not be able to capture. Mm -hmm. Just those off the cuff, you know, tactics that we use to demonstrate empathy ends up being very technically useful too. Mm -hmm. And just one thing to piggyback off of that, that's something that you couldn't get if you were to send your customer a, a questionnaire. When, when people are given a list of questions, what what is going on in your world there? They have more time to prepare the answer, but when you're just talking to them, it's it's person to person, like Toby said, they're more more likely to open up. So that's such a huge advantage of the face-to-face -face or video face-to-video -face, face customer interview. Uh, another way to, that um, testing assumptions or sort of paraphrasing back to them, why that is valuable is obviously as you're listening to them talk about things, you're thinking in it through your lens of what's, what's important to me. So for instance, if a customer is saying, oh my gosh, I'm dealing with all these supply chain issues, you might um, test it back and say, it sounds like an equipment supplier that can meet deadlines or respond on a dime is very important to you. Is that true? So there you're able to get some information that is important to your eventual marketing efforts and quickly test those assumptions and get their gut check. And it's okay to be wrong sometimes. They might say, no, actually, XYZ is actually more important, but you gotta ask. I don't know if you feel this way, um, I love when I am wrong, you know, when you test those assumptions and even I'll sometimes maybe go so far as to make an assumption, which I even know is wrong, but I just want to put it to them and like, like, tell me why this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Tell me why I'm wrong here. Um, it's just great. You always get a deeper, a deeper understanding of a thing if you poke and prod at it. Exactly. They say why it's wrong and you get more mm -hmm. of the, the why behind it. Listening in an active way is crucial on these calls. Um, if you're not going to go in ready to hear their story, I think you shouldn't go in at all. You should be listening to what they're saying. I, th I find it helpful to take notes on things that they're mentioning and circling back to that. Um, if they mention certain problems, circle back to that example or um, following your curiosity wherever it may lead you. Um, do you have anything else to add? I'm, I'm thinking of what the end product is on these calls. They're, it's intended to help inform messages that we put out later. Mm -hmm. And the, like the, the exercise of active listening is absolutely critical to, you know, we're turning this message back around essentially. It's almost like this customer is talking to us and we are about to talk right back at them or others like them. And so gathering, you know, understanding what they're saying and how they're saying it and in some cases maybe pushing them or goading them to use, use that language, um, it's, it's all important to us because at some point, and it might not be for months later, you're going to see this reflected back in that, in that direction. So what, everything you said is vital for that reason. Mm -hmm. And I think a, another key of active listening in these scenarios is not just listening for buzzwords in terms of, okay, now they're talking about equipment, or now they're talking about support they need for design things. Actually listening to their story and not just staring at your question list and waiting to just go through it, but remember this is first and foremost a conversation. So yes, you have those questions there to to guide you as um, guideposts along the way, but also listen to what they're saying and respond actively to that. My, my approach in customer interviews is to follow the customer where they lead the conversation. I don't want to force them to talk about X, Y, Z, what they look for in an equipment supplier, or when they're looking for a, a labeling partner, they may need to have X, Y, Z. It's, you're not gonna get the best answers there because you're forcing it upon them. I prefer to let them talk about their world, let them talk about their problems, let them talk about what concerns them. And as they do, the service that you're trying to learn more about or equipment or, or whatnot will naturally come up, then go ahead and dive in. But I find it much more beneficial to, to let them lead the way and 
bring it up. And, and if they don't bring up everything you wanted to talk about, that's okay. You, you got a great chunk of insight on what's important to them. And that's really what we're here for. We have the luxury in B2B industrial where a lot of the, you know, ultimately this is trying to sell stuff, right? But this, the thing we're trying to sell, it's not bubble gum or tennis shoes. It's in some cases, multi-million dollar pieces of equipment that very few people on the planet understand. And so uh, to follow the customer where they want to go, the stuff we, we need from them, the stuff they need to tell us, kind of emerges on its own in the form of a statement of what problems they're having. Because these are, you know, in most cases, very niche businesses, very niche problems that can only be solved in a, you know, very few ways. And so uh, we don't have to force them into it uh, most of the time. If we need to, sure, I'll push them, but uh, it's a last resort. Normally we don't have to do it. One of the things we ask, or sometimes we'll ask, is we'll ask the, a question in two ways. Like if we're trying to approach or understand a problem that a customer's having, uh, we'll ask, what is like, what's the business impact of this problem? Okay, or we'll ask, what is the operational impact of this problem? But then, and anytime I do this, I almost always preface it with, I'm sorry, I'm about to ask a really cheesy, touchy-feely question, but <laughs> what is the impact on you? How does it make you feel? You know, as if they're sitting on the couch in my therapy office. Um, and sometimes those questions will take them aback a little bit, but, you know, once they get over it, it's like there is a personal impact. We do react emotionally to problems. Even if we're talking about a piece of machinery, um, the people who use it are people. And so, you know, we have to figure out, like, going so deep into their story as, like, how does this make you feel? Are you mad when you're driving home because of something that happened? Just for example. I think a, a mistake I would sometimes make in customer interviews that I've tried to, tried to avoid or something that I try to work on improving is to, if I sort of have that feeling in the back of my mind that I'm not understanding what they're saying, they're, sometimes these people that we're interviewing, they're, they're talking about very complex engineering, manufacturing processes. I'll leave a customer interview and I'll, I'll look at my notes and I, I can tell, oh, I, I don't think I fully understood that or I would have really appreciated if I could have just asked them to, can you explain that to me in a different way or I'm, this is a little bit new to me, I'd love to hear this in, in layman's terms in terms of what that actually means or, or test my assumptions. So I think it's really important to if you have that feeling of, oh, I feel like I'm not getting what they're saying, don't be afraid to ask. I, I always like to preface it with a simple phrase of, I, I know this may be a simple question, but I want to make sure I understand. Can you explain how this works or can you explain this process to me in a different way? Um, because when I go back to the notes, if I don't have that full understanding, it prevents me from understanding what they're actually saying. So I think listening to those instincts of, I can tell I don't understand this. Let me ask about this right now. And, they're usually happy to oblige. It's so hard to keep all of that, keep track of it too. If they're going in a direction and they bring up something that you don't understand, but I don't want to interrupt them. You know, I've had this happen a number of times too, where like, hey, I don't get this, but keep saying what you're saying. And then to try to remember to go back, depending on what your note-taking style is, is if someone starts to say something wow, this is over my head, pound a bunch of pound symbols or ampersands right there in your note or highlight it if you think to do it and, and then it's there for you, just like a, you know, leaving breadcrumbs in the, on the trail. So recently I was able to conduct a series of customer interviews for a company that makes semiconductors and cable assemblies and in these customer interviews one of the, the key insights that was sort of bubbling to the top throughout these conversations was that they, they really appreciated this company's ability to sort of take a design where they, they knew where they needed it to go, but they weren't sure how to get there. This company, they were able to fill in that gap, take these sort of, I, I need the cable to do X, Y, Z, fit in this space constraint. Can you take it here for me? So hearing that repeatedly from different customers told us that 
this is a, a valuable, um, this is a value proposition that this company offers. So whenever we were working on doing a new website for them, that was really key in how we crafted the messaging for the homepage. And whenever we talked about um, the different services they offer, we made sure to have a specific service offering that spoke to this ability that they had to do design consulting or take, taking designs to the finish line is um, how one customer put it. When you look at their website beforehand, they, they didn't have anything speaking to this ability. It was some, more so just the individual pieces of equipment that they offered. But by talking to customers, we learned that their engineering capabilities were such a huge difference maker. So that made it a natural to put it front and center on the site and make it part of their unique value proposition. The risks, if we hadn't spoken to these customers for this particular uh, cable assembly client, I imagine we would have built a website that did not speak to what they offered best to customers at all. It would have been a website that, you know, maybe at a high level said, yes, we sell X, Y, Z, but it would have totally missed the mark in terms of what actually matters to customers that work with them, stay with them, highly value them, the kinds of customers they want to continue to repeat and grow and to continue to bring in. So yeah, a website that doesn't speak to what you're actually good at, that's what a, that really gets in the way of being able to bring in new customers and re replicate the business that you already have. So whenever I'm interviewing a customer, obviously the conversation will start off at a high level. Oh, supply chain issues are a problem for me. Or, oh, my design, my engineering design team is short staff. So we're speaking at a very high level, but to really get the, the good nitty gritty, the good juicy details, I find it very helpful to ask for specific examples um, can you tell me about a time when you did have a facility expansion and you were under a tight deadline and how an equipment supplier helped make that easier or how they, a bad supplier perhaps got in the way of success there? Hearing them talk about a specific example really helps illustrate those ideas and takes those high concepts they're talking about and really illustrate it in, um, in their actual world. That context from the customer interview is so helpful when doing good content writing to immediately create empathy with your, your reader, i.e. other potential customers. From a copywriting perspective, I think it's so important that we get those examples. And then not only that we get them, that we frame them in a certain way. To follow on your example was supply chain issues. Well, most people know kind of in their head what's a supply chain issue. And so I think in a lot of marketing you see them they only go that far. Supply chain issues. I don't like that. That's not, that's not enough. What did this, what did, what happened? What did the issues mean? What were they caused by? Is it because there's a boat stuck out in the ocean? Did a train fall off the tracks? Did a truck run off the road? Like what, what is the thing that happened? And so uh, what I like to do is if someone's talking about this problem, you know, envision myself standing on the factory floor with them, looking at the things that are causing problems. It's, it kind of goes back to the empathy thing and the active, active listening thing. Put yourself in their shoes. So when we, when we establish the actual problem that's happening and, and, you know, instead of it being some big thing like a supply chain issue, maybe it is, there was a shipping delay. Well, what's the shipping delay mean? It means that the stuff you're waiting for that's on a container ship cannot get on the truck. And if it's not on the truck, that means it's not on the way. And if this is a part you need to manufacture something bigger, you have a delay now. You have orders that you need to make up and you can't. Or you can by finding an alternative supplier and rushing you know, an alternative source of material and there's your cost. It, it skyrockets. Um, are you gonna pass that on to your customers or not? If the customers pre-ordered it and they paid for it, no. Uh, so now you're eating and you're losing money. So that's, to follow that example through, uh, you, you understand the full scope of these problems. Supply chain issues is where this started, but it ripples out. It goes a long way. And if, I've found that when I can actually tell that story and take the time to tell that story, even if it takes a hundred words, they're a hundred words well spent, I think, because customer's going to know exactly, you know, it's not just supply chain issue anymore, it's all of this stuff, big problems.
I find it essential in customer interviews to make sure that you are first and foremost respectful of their time. These customers don't have to be talking to you. you know, they're, they're helping you out by sharing their time, sharing their insights, um, cutting into their workday. So I, I find it really crucial to keep within the allotted time frame that you have scheduled. As you're approaching the five or 10 minute mark, uh, make sure that you're starting to, to wrap things up. Um, another, another thing that I find helpful for making the most of that time that you do have allotted, um, if you get their permission to record, I think recording is another way to, to make the most of your time. That way, if there's something that you misheard or wanted to go back and clarify, you do have that recording to rely on that way. You're not wasting precious minutes asking them to rehash things. So that is how I try to make the most of my customers' time that I talk to. Time flies when you're having fun and we, you know, we get close to end and it's like, oh man, there's more I want to go, go for here. And sometimes it's a matter of, you know, it's two minutes to go tell the customer, hey, we're, we're approaching time. We can stop now, or do you have a couple more minutes? Can we, can we keep going? Um, yes, we want to respect their time. I've found that these customers are very generous with their time, though, too. Um, in some cases, and you can tell just by how they sound, they're enjoying this as much as we are, so they want to sit and talk to us. I think what, what Mary said is important. Stick to the time. And if you're going to approach time, ask if we can go over. And if we can't, there's alternatives. Can I email you follow-up questions? Can we talk another time? All in all, customer interviews are, are such a valuable resource. And when you do get the chance to talk to them, it's an incredible opportunity to hear what they're concerned with in their own words, get a completely unfiltered look at what matters to them. So then you can go around and in turn create ads, content, marketing efforts that actually speak to them and will resonate with customers like them and help you grow your business and uh, have successful marketing efforts. So I uh, wish you good luck in your hopefully upcoming customer interviews. <laughs>